Thank you for I mean, offering me the opportunity to uh, speak to you about, uh, about uh, epilepsy. And uh, I'm not sure how many people are here today. Anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, you guys are really uh, motivated. There's, there's a lot of enthusiasm in, uh, in uh, coming to these meetings. And I'm sure we all learn something from uh, each other. And, and, and really today, what I'm going to be talking about in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion is about what, what stereo EEG is. And I, and I, and I, and I, called, I coined this, uh, this presentation, stereo EEG for all, just to uh, uh, point out, uh, point, point to the fact that this is gonna be a very simplified presentation. At the time I go into the technical details, but I try to uh, explain everything that might sound a little bit uh, 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 exotic for, for, for the non-epileptologist or non-epilepsy doctor. And again, thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. And, and uh, so, so what we're going to discuss with is stereo EEG uh, for, uh, I'm sure, I'm, I'm not sure how many people have heard about stereo EEG. Does that ring the bell to you guys? You can just raise your hand and say, if you've heard about stereo EEG before. Uh, I see one hand. Okay, that's, I mean, I, I'm not surprised. This is, maybe the word sounds, uh, a little bit un unfamiliar, but when I t start talking about the details, you will understand. You probably have to recognize one of those, one, one, one of the aspects of stereo EEG. Um, before we uh, really dive into the topic, I'd like to, yes, yeah. I do change. Okay, let's go be. Okay, let's go to some uh, 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 fundamentals, some like, basic principles. And I always like to make this distinction when I, whenever I have a talk on epilepsy, what is epilepsy, what is seizure? It's never too much to uh, really emphasize the, 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 this distinction between epilepsy and, and seizure. As you know, epilepsy is a disease. And it simply means that if you don't do anything, you will have like seizures over and over again and again, and those are unprovoked seizures. So really it's, your, it's, it's, it's when your brain for, uh, for some reasons sometimes known, sometimes unknown reasons, goes into seizures without any uh, external or uh, provoking factor. And if nothing is done, that will happen again. That's epilepsy. And that's why we need to do something to stop that from happening. If you have seizures, you can die from the seizure. You can hurt yourself. You can injure people if you're driving. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of stigma uh, associated with epilepsy, and, 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 uh, including work, I mean, uh, as far as work is concerned, or even um, uh, just interpersonal relationships. So, so really, epilepsy, and then also when you have epilepsy, you may uh, face other what we call comorbid uh, psychiatric conditions like depression, anxiety, and, and, and these all together makes epilepsy something of concern. That's why people have really uh, specialized in, in, in taking care of patients with epilepsy and this, this is different from seizure where you have a transient symptoms uh, you can start shaking your right arm or left arm or the whole body will start jerking what people call grammar seizure uh, or you may have some behavioral uh, uh, issues or some sensory symptoms or some visual changes that are transient I think, I think the word is transient it happens it goes away oftentimes on its own spontaneously and this is, and we think this is due to your brain cells being just of hyperactive. And this is called a seizure. So for you to have epilepsy, you must have a seizure. You can have a seizure without epilepsy. Let's say you drink alcohol or you have a concussion or, or, or you have an acute stroke, then you develop a seizure right after that. So that's not epilepsy, it's, 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 it's a seizure. You need a seizure to have epilepsy again, but you don't have epilepsy just because you had one seizure. Okay, this is very important. Now, when you, someone comes to a doctor and then start complaining of symptoms that are concerning for epilepsy, again, you have something that is transient, okay? You always want to know, does the patient have epilepsy? And this is a very important question. It's a key question. This is like the gate towards starting doing all those tests and, and starting in, in, in uh, uh, medicines. So, so you have to list, I think the most important part here is what the patient uh, so, or what the family or what bystanders will tell you about what happened. So clinical history is key. If you can, and you can make a diagnosis of epilepsy without an EEG, even without a brain MRI, if you're a good clinician. Doesn't always happen because sometimes it's not clear exactly what happened to the patient, right? So clinical history is key. Then when someone tells you about, tells you something that sounds like epilepsy, you want, always want to 
uh, be certain that it's epilepsy. So you add another piece to your puzzle, and that piece is the EEG, the brainwave test. Uh, you want to see how the brain wave, the brain waves look like. You want to see if the seizure comes from one spot or from different, from multiple spot, or if the whole brain just start having seizure at the same time. Uh, we also want to see if the person, person brain shows some abnormalities from where the seizure may come from, and that's why you do some brain imaging. The one that we typically do in uh, in most epilepsy center is a brain MRI. There's a special brain MRI called uh, 3T. Uh, epilepsy, uh, 3, 3T MRI, brain MRI epilepsy protocol that we uh, typically do. So you have these three components, the clinical history, the brain imaging, and the EEG. All, all those together help you to answer the question, does a patient uh, have uh, epilepsy? Uh, now, you think the patient has epilepsy, right? You get an EEG. Why do you get an EEG? Oh, I mentioned that earlier. You, you get an EEG because you want to make sure that the patient uh, first has epilepsy, that can help you, but you don't always need that for the diagnosis, but you need the EEG mostly to be able to give a name to the epilepsy. And you want to call that epilepsy either focal epilepsy or multifocal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy. And sometimes you, don't, you just don't know what, where, what, how to call that because it's not clear. And uh, when, when you call, what, what we call focal epilepsy simply, so the, this is a little diagram here that I draw. Uh, this is, these are the, the rather little uh, oval or circles are brain cells. So when you have seizures starting from one brain cell, this is the diagram again, it doesn't start, you need multiple cells to really uh, uh, work together to be able to produce the seizure. It's what we call hypersynchrony, meaning that things happen at the same time. They talk to each other very quickly at the same time and a lot of cells together because, before you can produce a clinical seizure. But this is the diagram. If it starts at some point of your brain cell, let's say one cell here, and then may spread to just adjacent cells, this is the focal seizure. So one spot of your brain is affected, and then it stays there. At time, it can go to the whole brain, but it's a focal onset seizure, it's a focal epilepsy. And up, as opposed to you can have a multifocal epilepsy, and this is simply a type of focal epilepsy where you have one and one, one focal, fo foci, right? Uh, and the one that, in, oh, in opposite to this one, you have the generalized epilepsy where you have the generator, uh, something deep in your brain, and there's a structure in the brain called thalamus, right? It's like, it, it, it the way I would I, I would uh, I would uh, my the analogy that I usually use, that I use for this is the, that of a conductor and an orchestra. If you have an orchestra and the conductor is the one making I mean causing trouble, so the whole orchestra will get involved, will get in trouble. So that's what happened with, with another epilepsy. So the same analogy for focal epilepsy. You have the orchestra, the the the, the musicians are playing, and then one musician will play a wrong note, and that will just disrupt the orchestra and that's a focal seizure when the conductor is the person in uh is a culprit is a person causing the causing trouble it's called generalized generalized epilepsy and i say sometimes you don't know so at this point you know that the patient have epile uh, has epilepsy you know the patient has a focal or multifocal or generalized epilepsy and then, then you start treating the patient, right? You give him anti-seizure medicine. I'm sure most of you have, have tried at least one seizure medicine. And, 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 and the doctor will use this, uh, uh, this, uh, 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 this diagram uh, to be able to choose, to, to, to choose your seizure medicine because there are seizure medicine that work for focal epilepsy and that would not work for generalized epilepsy. And that, that can actually worsen your generalized epilepsy. So you use these uh, uh, diagram these uh, uh, to, to to decide on what anti-epileptic drug to to give, the, to give to the patient. Then you do it. You try one, two, three, four seizure medicine. Nothing works. Okay, and then you come. You 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 want to ask yourself: Does the patient have refractory epilepsy? There is a definition of refractory epilepsy that uh, the ILE, the International League Against Epilepsy, came up with. Uh, it's, I will call it an operational definition of epilepsy. Uh, and, and someone actually said that this, we're trying to define, to define the undefinable, all right? And, and you guys probably know what I'm, heading, what I'm heading to. So for, according to the International League Against Epilepsy, for someone to have drug-resistant epilepsy, you must fed at least two anti medicines that are well-tolerated that are appropriately chosen and use, uh, and, and you have to make sure that the patient uh, use his, 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 his medication according to a clear schedule. So the, I think the, 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 the key word here is the 
appropriate choice of the, of the seizure of medicine, but also making sure the patient can tolerate the medicine. And uh, this is what happens sometimes. You give a patient a medication and it comes to you and say, ah, that doesn't work. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel fine. I feel dizzy. I can't I can keep, I can, I can take it. Then you switch to a different one and they come in and say, I had a rash. You switch a different one and they will come and say, hey, you know, doc, uh, I took up to, let's say, Tupac Max 50 milligrams twice a day and it's not working. I don't think it's going to work. You stop it. So would you call this patient uh, refractory? The answer is no, because you have, you've chosen three medicines, but none of, none of them were, was well tolerated and you didn't give the adequate dose of medication. This is scenario number one. Scenario number two, you see a patient with a, a 19 year old, uh, uh, no, sorry, that's a 15 year old uh, girl with uh, grandma seizure, call it grandma seizure, general epilepsy. And then you try her with, on carbamazepine and she comes in here, dog, you know what? Uh, I, I'm, still, I'm still having seizure. Actually, I'm, I'm still having more seizure than, than I used to. Then you switch to a trilepto and then she comes and say, ah, I, have, I'm, I'm, I think I'm not doing fine, dog, dog. And you went up to the maximum dose. So this, in this scenario, number two, the patient, does the patient have refractory epilepsy? The answer is no. And not because you chose the wrong drug because carbamazepine or trilepto are not good medicine for what seems to be a general, primary general epilepsy that the patient has. And we know that those drugs, those medicines can actually worsen their epilepsy. So before you call someone refractory epilepsy, be sure that you chose the right medicine and be sure to choose the right dose that you really up dose to what is supposed to treat the epilepsy and be sure that the patient has tolerated the medication before you can call that refractory epilepsy. We've seen patients uh, going to surgery and then uh, uh, that they didn't need surgery. Okay, I'm not blaming, I'm not saying that surgery, surgery is very important, surgery works, but you have to choose who you decide to work up for possible surgery. And we know that uh, two out of three patients will do well on medication. So just, not just, 30% of patients will be truly refractory, about 25, 30% truly refractory. And those ones are the ones that you start thinking about doing, uh, uh, I mean, doing something, something else than, than just the medication. And, and how, how do we treat those patients? We, we, as we mentioned earlier, you can use anti-epileptic drugs to do that. And that works in two thirds of patients, good. And sometimes you have to use other, uh, uh, other interventions like diet and the keto diet is one of the famous, famous diet. Basically you try to load the patient with fat and then you lower how much uh, carbohydrate or glucose they, they, they take. And it's not easy to, to do, works well on, 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 little, on little kids, mostly kids with some intellectual uh, disability. And you also, and the next step, step is in adult, oftentimes we think about surgery. And when you think about surgery, really you have to define the goals of your surgery. Am I trying to achieve seizure freedom, which is the ideal goal, which is what we should aim for. You don't go into surgery if you don't think the patient can be seizure free. That's key. In some patients, and this is rare, these are uh, really like little kids uh, with uh, severe uh, debilitating epilepsy, where you want to do a palliative surgery to just sort of uh, lower the seizure burden, frequency, and how often they have in them, and how severe the seizures are. You can do that in some patients. Those are patients with lignos gastro syndrome, for example, where you do a corpus callosotomy. So really, the surgery should be aiming at resecting, meaning, or burning one area, one specific area of the brain that is causing the seizure without causing additional damages to the person's brain. So when someone has surgery, at the end of the surgery, he should be able to function again, ideally, as he used to, without having uh, a high burden of seizures. And ideally, it should be zero seizures. We don't always achieve that, but there's, there's a score for if you can have, if you're able to have seizure to the point of going back to work, this, that's, that's still an achievement, right? But the, the goal is zero, zero, zero seizures. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about neurostimulation, but that's something that can be done as well. And again, you have to remember that neurostimulation, which is either, either RNS, DBS, I mean, RNS neuropace, or DBS, or vagal nerve stimulation. Though the goals, for, the goals are for this type of intervention is not usually zero seizure. You want to reduce the burden of seizures. So if there's one thing that works when nothing else besides medication works, and that can stop your seizure completely, it's surgery. 
but surgery one is wisely and chosen, carefully chosen and 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 done. And and, and that's this is where the strategy comes into play because you want to go. It's like it, it's a you, you need to go exactly where the the, the seizures are coming from what we call a seizure onset zone in the brain. And you want to go and remove that part of the brain. Remember what the patient has, what the, well, the, the clinical manifestations of epilepsy are not what the brain at the seizure onset typically do. Let me, let me rephrase that. When you have a seizure, let's say you start having a left arm shaking, okay? The left arm shaking is not the result of the abnormal brain activity where the seizure came from. It's not always like that. It's always a propagation, okay, of the initial EEG or brain abnormality. You have an abnormal electrical activity in your brain that starts somewhere and then spreads in the adjacent brain that is functional, what we call the symptomatic zone, symptomatic zone. That zone causes your symptom but it's not what causes your epilepsy to begin with. So if you go and resect that symptomatic zone, you will not stop the seizure. The seizure will find a way somewhere else. It's like someone start pouring water up, up on the tap and then water start uh, draining. And you see water somewhere in the road, you try to carry water from, from running on, on the road, on the, on, on the road. You won't, you, you, won't, you won't start the water from flowing. You have to go back to the source and close and really, and, 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 and shut off the tap, okay? That's the that's key, and that is why we do stereo EEG. Now I want to show this little diagram, little, little cartoon here. This is again down here. This is our brain with the focal seizure, right? Okay, and then you have the EEG. This is the surface EEG, the one that you guys have probably all had in the hospital. You come to the hospital, they stick glues on your scalp. And then you have those squiggly lines or running for 20 minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes for days in the hospital. That's a surface EEG. So the way you can understand, you need to understand the surface EEG is, is by, uh, um, just think about a microphone on the top of, the, of, a, of a roof and then you have an orchestra playing. So what is happening is that you have that microphone there trying to capture the sound, try to know where exactly the abnormal, the, where, where, where the musician playing the wrong note is located, okay? If you were here, for example, the, this, I mean, and, and there are multiple microphones, right? You have 20 microphones, you have, you have those, those, those uh, electrodes are microphones. You have many of them in the brain trying to recover the whole roof and try to see where the just are coming from. This is just an echo of something that started here and then that spread to the roof of the of the of the of the of the of the house where of the of the of the room where the orchestra is playing. If you get something here, that gives you a sense maybe that is, that things are coming from here that you don't know exactly. It's very broad. Okay, this sound could just uh, ricochet on the on the wall here and then come to the come to the uh, microphone here or one microphone here. You may think that it's coming from this area of the brain, but it actually came from here after ricocheting, ricocheting on this wall here. So the surface EEG gives you a sense of where the seizure is coming from, but it's very imprecise. Remember, it's a precision uh, surgery. So you want to go exactly where things are coming from. If you only use a surface EEG, you may not be able to achieve it. In some cases, you can do that, but when things are concordant, let me explain that. If someone comes to you and say, okay, doc, you know, uh, uh, or the, the, let's say the patient's partner will tell you that uh, the patient sometimes starts using his, rubbing his hands, smacking his lips, and then he's uh, still able to talk when, when he's doing that. Uh, it comes, that, 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 that happens off and on uh, several times during the day or during the week. Uh, you start thinking, oh, maybe this is right mesial temporal lobe epilepsy because you know that mesial, right mesial temporal epilepsy patients, they do this, they, they behave that way. Okay, now you get a patient MRI and you see a very, a, a nice scar tissue in the right mesial temporal lobe. That's the inner part of the temporal lobe on the side of the brain. You do an EEG, you see some sharp and some seizures on the right temporal region. Okay, so one, two, three. Clinical, remember the three, the three, the three 
uh, the three components of my, of, my, of, my, of my reasoning. The patient, what the patient says, or what you see on the patient, what the MRI shows, what the EG shows, they all go point towards the right mesial temporal, right mesial temporal lobe. And then you can you see the, and then you can tell that the seizure is coming from that right mesial temporal lobe. Okay, then you can go and do surgery on that, provided that provided the patient will remain uh, will not have any uh, sequela from that. And there's a way, there's a way to be able to limit to mitigate that risk. Okay, so surface EEG it helps sometimes, but rarely. I mean, not all the time. That's why you need the uh, that, that's, that's why that's why you need the steroid EEG to be able to uh, exactly localize where things are coming from. I put routine EEG here, but you have to, this is a, a typo. It should be stereo EEG, not, still, not routine EEG, my, my mistake. So this is stereo EEG, okay? So for the stereo EEG, you really want to get your microphone through the roof, through a hole in the roof, okay? And right where you think it's coming from, okay? And once you're here, if you say, if you tell someone that you had a microphone here and then you heard, this, you heard, you heard a noise, the, the wrong noise, the wrong, the wrong note uh, being played here. If you tell me that I'm there, okay, okay, I'm more convinced that this is, is actually coming from this area of your brain. Okay, making sense? So the stereo EEG is really the way of precision. You want to know exactly what is not coming from, then you get your microphone or you stick it out, in, stick it into, in, in, into the roof, into the roof, into the room, and then you get close to where things are starting. And then you know exactly that they are starting here. And you can tell your surgeon to go and remove exactly that area of the brain or burn it. It's precision. Okay. But this, and how do we do that in practice? So what happened is that you have these uh, electrodes here. Uh, they're, they're called depth electrodes, right? You, this, this is the one that we use the most in, in Hershey. We rarely use these ones here. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll take, touch you a little bit about, I'll tell you a few words about, about, about the one on the, on the, on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side is what we typically use in Hershey in most centers now. Uh, it's called depth electrodes. So those are little like spaghetti noodle-like uh, electrodes with up to uh, uh, I know between between five and eighteen contacts. Uh, these are contacts here. You see the little like silver color uh, rectangle. These are contacts here. Okay, and this is the area that actually capture the seizures. Okay, one, two, three, four. These are eight contacts here. You can have up to 50, 18 contacts. And, 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 and the surgeon will use a, a stereotactic uh, um, a frame uh, to uh, know exactly where to insert those noodles, those packet noodles, and they are relatively safe. And, and, uh, and you, you guys understand that before you can go into, the brain is so big, I mean, there's so, there's so much volume in the brain that you just can start plugging uh, those uh, depth electrodes anywhere in your brain. So you have to have what we call a clinical, hypothesis. What I mean by that is that you have to have a sense of where they're coming from. Okay, let me tell you about this scenario so that you can understand it better. You get someone in the hospital and he or she tells you that, oh, I've been having this manual automatism. My hands just start doing things that I don't want to, want to do. And I start smacking my lips. I start staring off, but I can still talk. You get a patient MRI, you get, you see, the left and the right temporal lobe uh, are a little bit bright. It's what we call, it's, there's, there's, there's scar tissue in the left and the right side of, your, of the brain. And that's like, okay, what you see, the right hand, the legs marking, those are not perfect uh, indicators that things are coming from the right side, okay? In a small proportion of patients, they can come from the left side. And your MRI tells you that the right side is abnormal, but the left side is also abnormal. You do an EEG and you see what we call spikes. Okay, those little blebs on the on the EEG on the left or on the right side. Are you going to just go ahead and take your, the right side, the right side of the brain, you, of the of the temporal lobe? You can't do that because you can see the seizure can still come from the left side. In that instance, you want to go inside and do what we call a still EEG. You try to remember you you sneak your microphone in, get to the left temporal lobe and then close to the right temporal lobe, and you see you can capture a seizure coming from this area. If after three, five days, you captured 40 seizures that are all coming from the right side, then you can tell the son that I think all those seizures are coming from the right side. The left side is just there, it's just making noise. It's just, a, just a, a background noise. I don't think it's something really important to worry about, okay? So you must have a clear clinical hypothesis. Okay, and there are many, many scenarios. I, I can go over I can go over all of them tonight. 
Um, and what we see on the right side, those are uh, what we call software grids and strips. They are larger. They, 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 they often require like, open a big, uh, a, a big hole in the, in the skull. Meanwhile, this one, you just drill a hole, a little hole, and then you sneak those uh, a little spaghetti like noodle uh, electrodes into the holes right where you want the, the, to want to capture the seizures. And this is what it looks like on a skull here. You see all these electrodes here? This, these are dead electrodes. In this patient, it was placed on the temporal region on this side, and then also one temporal and then somewhere in the insula. Anyway, that's very important. These are, this is how it looks down the x-ray, okay? You see these contacts here? So the contacts actually are radio opaque, so you can see the contacts here, one, two. You can count them. In this case, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There were 10 contacts here in this, in this case here, per electrode, okay? You see how much it covers? It covers not a lot, but at least if you have a good hypothesis, you get close to where you want to get to, and then you capture what you want to capture. Uh, this is the same picture, same patient, and, and this, this time you can see on the MRI what they look like, okay, the, the, the contact. And in this case, we put them in the, in, the, in, the, what they call, in the back of the brain, occipital region, and then in the mesial temporal region, in the lab here and here. Uh, now, okay, this doesn't go without, uh, uh, without pros and cons, right? They are ups and they are uh, uh, advantage and inconvenient of, uh, of, of, of stereo EG. And the, the, what, what we know about stereo EG is that it's very specific, it's very accurate in localizing the seizure focus. Uh, I, would, I would say the seizure onset focus, right? It can tell you exactly where things are coming from. And when you do that, when you know exactly where it's coming from, then you can do a better resection. Like we, you just create a small, tiny portion of the brain where you know exactly where the cells are coming from. And the outcome is better because you went right where the seizures, the seizures were coming from and you, you remove the seizure onset zone. Remember, you want to go and take out the seizure onset zone, where the seizure starts. All right, it comes at a cost, right? It's invasive because, I mean, no matter what you have to, it's someone's brain. You're sticking those things to someone's brain. It's invasive. Uh, it's expensive, okay? It's a lot of money, and it's also time-consuming. I can tell you, uh, it can take you a whole day to read the entire, uh, entire recording. Because think about that. One contact is one squiggly line. If someone gets 10, uh, let's say, five on each side, five, 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 is that, that's, that's, that's already 50 contacts. So 50 squiggly lines to look at. And the other one, 50, if you get 50 on the other side, that's 100 squiggly lines to look at every day for 24 hours for 10 or 14 days. I mean, sometimes more than that. Uh, there are risks with still EEG. Uh, the, uh, the major risk, major risk are infection and hemorrhage, but this is very rare. I've, in my Personal practice, I've seen one out of maybe well, 50 cases when I was a fellow, and I've, I've not seen any here. Uh, so between 0% and 7.5% of patients, we have a, either a brain bleed, a small brain, it's really a small brain bleed along the axis where, the, where they put the, 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 the depth electrodes. And, uh, um, and we know how to lower that risk. You take it off aspirin. If you're taking Depakot, you take it off Depakot. Depakot can cause, can cause someone to bleed. Okay, that's why we don't want to do surgery on someone on death record, which is CGM, as you guys all know. Uh, there were no death from, like, you look at thousands of patients that didn't see any death from the death electrode. Just less than 0.5%, actually 0.4% will have a permanent uh, uh, deficit from, from, the, from, the, from the procedure. And we also know that sometimes when you go there with a little, little uh, death electrode, you can cause a subclinical seizure. It's a seizure that you see only on the, on the, on the EEG but the patient will have nothing. So the risk really, when you compare that to the benefits, it's, I would say it's really acceptable. It's, it's acceptable. I would go for that if I had to, if I had to. Now, let me just show you just two slides to, 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 uh, to conclude. One of the surface EEG, this is what the patient surface EEG looks like. This is what you see um, when you do the one that, the regular EEG, right? The one you do every day, every and all, and all. it looks like this. So you see that it's really like it's it's just a junk of lines and 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 you can if you I man for those who do do, do, who do epilepsy <coughs> so and we over with EEG if you ask them what is is the seizure coming from the left side which is here or the right side here uh, no, we don't know we don't know you know it's somewhere it's, it's, there's something like this and we know we don't know is it coming from the temporal lobe or is that this is the temporal this is the temporal lobe here 
or is it coming from more in the central region? It's still not clear. Maybe temporal up here, maybe temporal. We don't know. So you see my microphone there, my role was good to capture CJ, but it was able to tell me exactly where things were coming from. Despite all my efforts, I put like one, two, three, four, five, 20 microphones. All right. And still, I don't have enough information. All right. And then I say, okay, uh, let's go in and, and, and see if we can get more seizures. That's why we did a sterile EEG implantation. And we see that. Without being a, an epilepsy doctor, if I tell you that if you see a new rhythmic fast activity, it's called seizure. You see this here? This is seizure starting here. I can tell that the seizure is going to start starting RA2. RA2 is the right interior amygdala. So really, I know exactly where it's coming from. And RH1. So from this, I have a point where I know the seizure is starting uh, from. Exactly. So I narrow down from, I don't know exactly to, I know exactly where it's coming from. Okay. And if my MRI is concordant, and my, if, my, if the clinical similarity is concordant, I'm like, okay, I'm fine. Sometimes MRI can be normal. You still do surgery on, on, the, on, the, on those patients. Right. So we see that this is a very useful technique, but yeah, it has to be uh, chosen carefully and uh, we need to know about the pros and cons of the technique. And, uh, and uh, I think it's there to stay. I, I, don't, think, I, don't, I don't see how we can, we can skip this in some patients. Thank you for your attention.